Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another outstanding author joining us this week. He is the three-time champion of Slovakia, the highest-rated player in the country, and an award-winning author, in fact. His 2018 book, Under the Surface, has been recommended on this very podcast many times, and it was the winner of the ECF Book of the Year that year. He's out with another offering from our friends at Quality Chess. This one is called The Secret Ingredient. It is co-authored by Super Grandmaster uh, David Navarra, And this one is more about the practical side of chess, and I've been reading it in anticipation of this interview. And it's also a fantastic book. So I'm excited to talk about both of these books and about our guest's career. So let's go ahead and introduce him, Grandmaster Jan Markos. Jan, thank you for joining us. Uh, Hi. uh, Thanks for your invitation, Ben. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, there's as we were discussing just moments ago, there's so much chess content now that often there's people that I'm very eager to interview. And it's just a matter of like, okay, this is the week. And obviously with your new offering from Quality Chess, um, I felt like it was a good time. And I've been really enjoying digging into both of your books in recent weeks. So if you don't mind, Jan, we'll save the chit chat for later in the interview and just dive right into the books. Are you are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I thought we would start with Under the Surface. And for listeners, I do want to give a bit of context, just my personal impression. As I said, both of, and Jan actually has three books. His, he also wrote a 2008 book about the King's Indian, which if you're a King's Indian player, you guys are welcome to check out. But you know how it is with opening books. They're very specific and theory evolves quickly and stuff like that. So we'll be primarily discussing Jan's uh, more recent works. Now, Under the Surface, I should say both of Jan's books are I would say ideally suited for more advanced players, but as has been the case with a few recently discussed books, it's sort of philosophical, especially under the surface, and the secret ingredient is more practical. So there's lessons that I think are very universal for all players, especially tournament players, um, but did just want to give a warning that the the chess material itself um, is reasonably advanced, as you might expect when it's a grandmaster, one of the uh, top players in his country writing the book, as, as Jan is. So... Without further ado, I thought, Jan, we would start off by, I would read you a quote from Under the Surface, and maybe you could expound on it a little bit. Does that sound good? Okay, okay, let's do it. Excellent. So hopefully you won't claim to be misquoted. (laughs) Um, So you say, Jan, I learned that the significant difference between a club player and a professional is not that the grandmaster can see much further or that he can calculate much more accurately or faster. This might all be true, but the significant difference can be found elsewhere. Grandmasters can see deeper. And this book invites you to study the depth of chess. So could you expound a little bit on on uh, what you mean by that, Jan? Uh, well, maybe this, this quote is very nice because it sums up what interests myself in chess. Uh, I, um, I, I really like the depth of chess, uh, I, uh, the, the depth of ideas which are hidden behind, uh, behind the moves. And uh, I was never a real fighter, or, although being... Uh, like reasonably successful when playing. Uh, what 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 I was mostly interested in is the depth of chess ideas, and um, yeah, uh, many times uh, club players think that when they solve another one hundred diagrams or they buy another opening book or or do something like that, they will. Um, Kind of automatically get to to, to a higher level, to a, a competitive level or, or grandmaster level or so. But what differs really is the understanding. So uh, analyzing with strong players and 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 speaking with them uh, is what what might uh, might be the difference. And that's, as I said, uh, really what interests myself: the depth of ideas in chess. Yeah, and in addition to the depth, Jan, you also in the book talk about the width of ideas, which is something that I definitely uh, it resonated with me. I'm I'm about a 2100 player, and I do find that often it's not so much that the moves I see I don't calculate well enough, as you say that may be true, but it's also just in, to entirely miss ideas. 
Um, so in your work as a, as a trainer, do you, do you have any advice or observations about uh, what, what adults can do to increase the width of their vision to make sure that they don't miss moves? Well, first of all, uh, you need to, uh, to, to think about the position in words, uh, not only like uh, with, with, uh, in, in some kind of lines or um, analysis of moves. Um, because when you speak about the position or try to describe it and discuss it in your head uh, with words, you might think about the concepts as well and 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 come up with some kind of um, uh, new new fresh idea. This is very typical in brainstorming, uh, not only in chess but also in other areas. That there are some uh, ideas which come up very quickly, and you just automatically they spring into your head because this is how your 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 head is wired up. Uh, and then uh, there is some 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 time when there are no ideas, and you just need to force yourself to to get go get through this desert of of, of zero ideas. And I think here the thinking in in words rather than moves might help. Yeah? Just asking like about the pieces, about the key concepts, and so on. But you also uh, this is also quite diffi- uh, important. You also need to know the concept. Actually, you know, you need to know how to think about about the position in words. And this is uh, what I was trying to do in under the surface to just give a new language to some concepts which we might intuitively somehow um, uh, understand, but we lack clarity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And. Hearing you talk about sort of the distinction between thoughts that that come to you automatically and thoughts that you kind of have to reach for made me think of the fact that you uh, quoted um, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman in in, uh, one of your books. And I I really enjoyed that book. And I know Grandmaster Jesse Cry uh, in some of the work he does with Chess Dojo has has talked about it. Um, So hearing you talk like that made me wonder, and I know uh, JJ Lang, who's been on the podcast, Adult Improver, is a big fan of Under the Surface. He also um, chimed in on Twitter wondering sort of what your background is um, to have sort of such a, a wide array of references in, in both of your books. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a, uh, I have a master in philosophy and uh, Protestant theology. It means that uh, I was also dealing um, uh, with thinking and the depth of thoughts even outside the, the, the region of jazz. And I'm also the author of several non-chess books on ethical dilemmas, on um, uh, hoaxes and disinform- disinformations, on the uh, connection of science and, um, and uh, well, phenomenology, let's say. So quite... quite, quite uh, complex um, areas I would say and uh, somehow like thinking is something what I what I like to do and what I uh, maybe do quite well that's interesting both Jesse cry and um, JJ Lang also have uh, philosophy backgrounds so before we get back to the chess books Jan are are you is your primary profession chess or are you uh, is your primary work outside of chess well um at, at, at this moment, it's maybe 50-50. Yeah, I, I work mostly as a chess coach. and uh, Sometimes I write something. Uh, I, I have to admit that I didn't play a, a, a tournament game for maybe more than a year. But, but I'm coaching. Uh, but I'm also like uh, lecturing uh, companies and NGOs and so on in uh, critical thinking and other non-chess stuff. So, so it's like I'm standing on both these legs. Sounds pretty fun. So you you basically read a lot, I guess. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, and that definitely comes across in in your works. Um, so let's let's get to another quote. Um, and actually, um, first I'll read the quote, and then I'll dive into the the second question, which is um, from supporter of the podcast Chris Wainscott, and they're they're kind of intertwined. So in in under the surface, you you say each piece on the chessboard should be regarded from three perspectives. First, as an active tool that we can use to achieve our goals. Second, as a vulnerable and valuable creature, which requires care all the time. Third, it's important as a, quote, piece of wood, which is standing in the way of its fellows. And then Chris wrote in to ask another fan of Under the Surface, by the way, wrote in to ask, he said, Under the Surface had a very unique approach to covering its subject matter. For example, the three faces of a piece. 
I'm wondering how you decided to explain the concepts the way you did. Did you decide what you wanted to write about and then come up with such a unique way to present the material? Or was that already how you thought about the lessons? Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, I should I should reveal the background. How was how was on the, the surface, how it came to life? Uh, actually, um, I was writing uh, articles for myself for several years, uh, thinking about some concepts and just writing them. And I, I, I didn't have in my head uh, that I want to write a, a book. I just wanted to collect the ideas which I found interesting about chess. Then I have put it in on, on some Czech uh, chess web page, and I understood that they are uh, uh, quite liked. So then uh, I, I, I collected them and, and created the book. So basically, um, uh, Under the Surface is a book which I wrote for myself. Uh, and 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 uh, like for me to to clarify the concepts and to to understand myself what what I'm actually thinking about chess, um, and this is, and I also use the concepts when I was coaching, for example. I I feel that when we come to the three phases of of a piece, uh, that mostly the the amateur players or the club players they usually focus on the active uh, phase of the piece. And they just don't feel the vulnerability enough and don't feel the, the harmony between the pieces enough. So I just felt this, this might be a nice way how to, how to, how to show it. Uh, and also the more lively the metaphor is, um, and, and the, the, the more it sticks into the head, the, the more it is educational, let's say. So that's what I was trying to do as well, to, to make it uh, a bit mysterious and, and, and very sticky. Yeah, it's qu it's quite sticky and quite illuminating. Did do you feel Jan um like you kind of always had a unique perspective like when you were sort of rising through the ranks in the chess world, did you always feel like you kind of looked at the game in a different way or do you feel like you just are able to explain it in a different way? Um I think that my approach was was always um uh, focused on understanding rather than and explaining rather than uh getting the successes. So, so I was uh, uh, I was never very good in like you know uh, timing my 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 shape for some important tournament or just you know uh, some tournament strategies or or, or, or whatever. Uh, I quite often lost games in in some tense situations because I didn't have uh, the nerves to 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 overcome it. But but the understanding and the thinking about chess. Uh, uh, unpractical and abstract thinking was always something uh, what uh, did interest me. Okay, yeah, um, I, it comes across. And again, it's for any listeners who struggle with like a certain idea. I think that that these books are great, especially under the surface. Again, for philosophical and in terms of like actionable advice, uh, definitely recommend the secret ingredient. So I'm going to dive in on to another Twitter question. This one is from uh, Dances with Worms and. And he asked you, what do you think is well covered by chess instruction and what is missing? Is there a field that chess sh should learn from? And then he says, also, why do adult improvers find it so difficult to find books that result in material improvement, despite so many of these books being really very good texts? Well, the, the answer to this question uh, is actually the second book we will speak about. Secret yes, ingredient, exactly. Because, yeah, which, because, yeah, I've got some good quotes for that. Because what I, what I felt... Uh, before uh, I and, of course, together with, with David Navarra, um, when we were speaking together, like, how should we build up the book, we just felt that there are plenty of people which have uh, a lots of chess knowledge, but the knowledge is very theoretical. Yeah, they have hundreds of books which um, they can quote from, and and uh, but but they have problems to actually when they are sitting at the board to just uh, show the knowledge and 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 show the class they have. So I think the um, the field which is uh, not well covered by 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 uh, many authors is the practical side of chess. How to decide at the board, how to um, how to defend, especially positional defense, how to um, manage your time, uh, how to prepare, for example, and so on. Of course, uh, the, 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 the easiest way how you can uh, create many chess books is to focus on openings. Uh, so so this, this area is just uh, overcrowded, I would say. 
and uh, the practical side of chess is, I think, uh, very scarce to, to find a nice book on that. Yeah, there are a few books that come to mind. Um, uh, one being uh, John Nunn's Secret of Secrets of Practical Chess, uh, sort of uh, uh, to the point. Um, and actually, uh, I recently interviewed your fellow quality chess author, Axel Smith, and uh, his newest book, Street Smart Chess, also, I think, sort of falls under that, that umbrella. But OK, it's part of my job as doing this podcast. But you can see that I fall into this category, right? I I, uh, I love chess. I play, you know, I made it to about 2200 feet when I was 18. And now my knowledge is, ex you know, has expanded greatly over the especially the course of doing this podcast. But my skills um, are either getting worse or staying the same. <laughs> so it's funny that even when the problem is diagnosed and even when you're aware of it, that doesn't mean that, that you're going to make better moves. Um, sure, sure. I'm, 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 uh, <laughs> you know, I'm uh, experiencing the same, maybe on a on a bit higher level. But okay, I also know my faults, and uh, it's difficult to to improve them. Yeah. Yeah, and what what's going on with with your game? So obviously, one of the perks of being the best player in your country, you've played in many Olympiads. You've played Maxime Vachir Lagrave and other uh, elite players. Um, are are, are you going to continue to compete for your country internationally, and are you still able to work on your own game, Jan? Well, actually, I'm 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 rather focusing on my on my uh, books, especially the non-chess books on the uh, on the mo at the moment. And we have two small kids, so I will probably more focus on coaching and writing and and so on. But okay, one day, who knows? I, I might return. Um, uh, but at, at at this moment, it's not priority to to make myself uh, a better player. So, would you sh still show up and play at something like the Olympiad, um, or is it? You well, know, do you feel like you would need to prepare? Ho hopefully, yes. Hopefully, yes. But but maybe not in the in the in the next few weeks, a uh, few oh. years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how old are your kids? Uh, they are four and six. So yeah, they we we need some time to spend with them. Yeah, I, I can I can definitely uh, relate to that. Um, okay, and next uh, Twitter question is from Puddings Jack, and he asks, "What type of players did you have in mind when writing these two books, and who would benefit most from them? Kids, adults, rating range, etc." Um, so I'll let you answer, and then I could give my own <laughs> opinion if you want. Yeah, when it comes to under the surface, I was trying to make it. Uh... Uh, a, a tram book so a book which you can read in a tram yeah so you don't need uh, uh two boards as Nimsovich said so one for analysis one for, for one for the main line uh it just you can read it from cover to cover without the chessboard i would say so it should be a book which inspires and uh, uh and not a very you know heavyweight book which which makes you suffer and and uh <laughs> And work. Uh, maybe it's not uh, well suited for very young kids because the concepts might be uh, quite elaborate uh, at, at some moments, but definitely like 10, 12 year old kids are able to, to, to read it. And mostly it's, uh, it's, it's well um, accepted by club players. But even like my, my, my friend from the Slovak, um, from the Slovak national team, uh, told me after reading that book that he found concepts which he didn't know. So, so even grandmasters might be inspired sometimes. Um, but again, uh, it's not for uh, absolutely uh, small kids, and it's not for like people who are uh, making their first steps on the chessboard. That you need at least to have some tournaments uh, behind you to to um, to make the most of it. And when it comes to the secret ingredient. Um, it's mostly for people who want to improve because it's a less pleasant book, let's say, and <laughs> it's more about work and, uh, and, 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 um, yeah. Um, it's, it's really for people young or senior who want to improve their chess and, and want to think about how they are playing the game and, uh, yeah, what, what could, uh, they do better. Basically it's a book where I distilled, uh, my knowledge as a coach, uh, I'm coaching for maybe 15 years now, so 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 here you find what I came up with. Yeah, and I I basically agree. I would it would have to be a precocious 12 year old to read your book because for one thing you're you're so worldly. I mean uh, the the references span beyond the chess world, which is to your credit. 
but I think for someone younger, they might benefit from the chess material, of course, but the sort of uh, broader tying it all together, they might um, not get the full benefit of. Um, but other than that, I agree. I've noticed um, uh, Yosin, um, Yosin Langstrand, uh, aka Dr. Patzer, wrote a nice review, and actually I have a question for you, follow-up question from him in a second, but he compared your book to The Seven Deadly Chess Sins, which uh, also gets mentioned a lot on this show. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in my mind, that's a very favorable comparison. I, I love that book. Um, and uh, his question actually was, uh, and you just mentioned Nimzovich, uh, if you were influenced by Nimzovich or my system in, in particular, because in his review, he drew that comparison, although I just reread my system and I almost considered that an insult, but I'll let you go ahead. Well, I, I, I would, I will be probably a bit heretical here uh, because I think that Nimtsovic is um, uh, well, it, it, a great chess thinker, but a very lousy writer, actually. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I really suffered when I was reading his books because, okay, it, there, is a, there is a time gap uh, which, which is significant. Uh, maybe uh, 100 years ago, uh, the books were written a li little bit differently, but... But somehow I, I, I don't like the pros, uh, but I like the ideas, so so I can live with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there is some good stuff in there. I'll actually, I am Christoph Zalecki, Chess Explained, and I are, are, have been preparing to do a podcast on my system, which will be coming out not too long, probably after this interview. But, um, you know, I'll just go ahead and spoil it that, that I basically agree. I found it a bit of a chore to read, um, even though it obviously is, you know, deserves its place in the canon and was written a long time ago and maybe there's translation issues and all that. But yeah, I kind of joked uh, to um, Dr. Patzer that he shouldn't have insulted you when he compared it to, uh, to my system. Um, okay. Um, next question. And again, we have so many fans and I will, a lot of them are very well read and um, reasonably strong players. This one is from why must I lose to this idiot, which is also an image of its reference. Um, a AKA Matt, um, who said, firstly, thanks for Under the Surface. Your second book is on my wish, wish list. And secondly, are there new chapters you might add if you were writing it today? And he said, for example, he's thinking of uh, things like top players have learned from the new breed of neural net computers, such as AlphaZero. Uh, definitely the, uh, the, uh, the question what can be learned from, from AlphaZero is, is like extremely interesting. But I don't feel I have the, you know, the, the computer skills and, and all the, you know, um, programs and, and analysis tools and not even the time to, to analyze what, what actually happened uh, in the uh, Alpha Zero revolution. I think that it was, it was well covered by, uh, by Matthew Sadler in the, in the Game Changer uh, book. So, so I would probably avoid that. Um, definitely could be some new chapters um, but at, at this moment um, I, I don't have a like uh, one exact topic in mind or, or whatever yeah and even though you say that the secret ingredient obviously it is much more focused on the practical than the the philosophical um, as as compared to under the surface but I feel like if you gave me both books I would know they were by the same author so um, <laughs> even though they're separate topics, um, I, I think that there kind of is a through line between the two books. Um, so definitely, um, Matt, recommend that you uh, that you you get the secret ingredient as soon as possible. And listeners, we'll be doing, um, at the end of the podcast, we'll be uh, doing a contest to give away a few of uh, Jan's books. Jan was nice enough to get a headset just for this interview. So the least we can do is get, uh, get his book in a few more people's hands. Um, so I think we just have, okay, one more question, and then uh, I want to talk about your newer book. So, um, and this one is more sort of uh, general chess advice. So this is from Martin McGowan on Twitter, who says, I want to know why after analyzing a position carefully and making the move, does it only take my future self a split second to see the monstrous blunder I just made? Hello, future self, some help in the present would be appreciated. So I, I do feel like you're you're uniquely qualified to answer. Like what's what's going on with the sort of uh, neuroscience of noticing a blunder the second you make a move? Well, um, I, I've done exactly this thing several times during my career. Uh, I remember when I was uh, playing Jelena Sedina and Dmitry Pakap on the first board uh, for Slovakia, and I was uh, 
I, I was uh, calculating some lengthy lines and then I, I made a move and got a made in one. So I can <laughs> I can relate to this uh, definitely. Ouch. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's the the. The, the, the difficult thing is that we are diving in when we are going to, you know, thinking about the position we are like diving in uh, into it and going into uh, more and more detail and more and more depth or lengthy lines and then we have to come out uh, reasonably slowly yeah if we just decide uh, very quickly and it's the same as if a diver comes very quickly out from some deep deep lake it doesn't make it, it actually doesn't isn't a good idea we we need to also like come up out of the water of of, of lines reasonably slowly so that we can again uh, have a look at all these all these um uh, more basic and um, well generally speaking stupid things like <laughs> are my are my pieces hanging and and and, and all this stuff so um Maybe just uh, make the move a little bit slower so that your future self can catch up and 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 join you before you actually make the move. That would be my advice. That's an amazing analogy about sort of coming coming up from the the deep sea, stopping along the way. Um, actually, it's like uh, very unhealthy to do it very quickly. Yeah, it's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that that's excellent. Yeah, and it helps to helps to look around. But somehow, no matter how much you look around, you won't see the blunder until you make the move um, every once in a while. So that gets at the practical side of chess. And on that note, I want to bring it forward to your excellent new book. But first, Jan, we're going to take a break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessMood.com. ChessMood is a subscription video service by a team of GMs headed by Grandmaster Avchek Gregorian, who you can hear on episode 192 of Perpetual Chess. They offer a comprehensive video library featuring an opening repertoire for both colors, as well as courses on middle game and end game mastery. They also have great free content. Avtech has an insightful blog, and they have a YouTube channel featuring daily lessons with a Grandmaster. So all the links you need if you want to find out more are in the show description or just go to chessmood.com and have a look around if you're interested. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by aimchess.com. If you haven't checked out aimchess.com by now, what are you waiting for? What Aim Chess does is it collects your games from the major chess sites and then gives you actionable advice of how to improve your game. It might be to work on a specific opening or to get better at end games or improve your time management or whatever it may be. And then it gives you related puzzles to help you improve that specific skill. They are constantly improving the site. They recently added blindfold tactics, time management training, common checkmate patterns. So there's so much to do there. If you decide to subscribe, be sure to use the promo code PERPETUAL30. Details are in the show notes for aimchess.com. And we are back. So to give listeners a bit of context, the secret ingredient, um, as I mentioned at the top, uh, Jan co-authored with Super Grandmaster David Navarra. He's, of course, uh, been one of the best top 25 players in the world, uh, renowned as a nice guy. He's been on this podcast um, um, and always insightful in whatever he writes. Um, and the format of the book is it appears to be mostly written by Jan. But then each topic that Jan talks about, as he mentioned, it might be time trouble, um, it might be uh, agreeing or not agreeing to draws, um, it might be opening preparation. Those are just some of the examples of the, the topics. Um, he then asks uh, David to share a few of, of, his, uh, of his insights, of his perspective on those particular topics, and then he asks him a few pointed questions at the end of the chapter. So it's a collaboration with uh, great insights from um, both Grandmasters. Now, Jan, we touched on this earlier, but I actually want to start just drilling a little deeper on the the paradox of uh, of why adults um, often can can learn more but not play better. So I'm going to read the quote. Although again, you alluded to it, but I'll read you the quote verbatim, and then maybe we can talk about it a bit more. Um, so I believe it's in the introduction to the secret ingredient. You say, I've come across an interesting paradox in my last 15 years of coaching. Many club players have deep chess knowledge. They're familiar with the theory of openings. They've read everything from Nimzovich to Kasparov, and they have a good strategic feeling. And yet, while sitting at the chessboard, they struggle to turn that knowledge into victory. So again, we talked about this, and this is sort of the the overriding theme of your book. But what specific prescription would you give do we need like 
all guests on the show always say you need to drill more tactics. Is is that it? Like, w- what can we do to translate the knowledge into skills? Well, actually, I don't think uh, it's so easy that you just need to drill more tactics because there are many um, many aspects of of chess uh, praxis um, that that need to be improved, and and tactics is just one of them. Um, I think that there is a, a another paradox which is interesting, that the things or the examples or the topics that that fit well into chess literature are not the same topics and examples that are actually helpful for a player to improve. Yeah, because, for example, if you if you want to uh, find a tactical uh, uh, a tactical example that fits very nicely into your um, into your chapter or into your book, you would find an, uh, an example which is uh, very clear, uh, easy to explain, nice, and so on and so on. But chess life is not like that. Yeah, so uh, what I think we need to do is actually to 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 uh, focus on the pros of the chess life, yeah, not the the poetry which you usually get into in the book, which are intended to entertain you, but into the pros. How is it to make this all everyday small decisions? How to uh, do the, these tactics, which is not uh, black and white. Uh, uh, which doesn't have a nice point uh, in, at the end of the line, but you simply need to to, to do your chores and 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 uh, have a look at this. How to defend positions? For example, uh, there are very few good books on positional defense because it, that's such a gruesome stuff, you know, to defend yeah. the position for 50, 50 moves and maybe you will lose anyway. But for example, uh, being able to to positionally defend for a long time and to know how to do that is one of the main cornerstones how to get into professional chess. I'm I'm deeply um, convinced about that. So uh, there are, there are several uh, topics uh, which which are I think very important for a young player or a, a adult a club player uh, to be dealt with uh, in order to improve. But they just don't sell well, like in the text. <laughs> so, so what we did with David uh, is that we tried to to put these topics into one book, uh, although they are not that fancy. And we just wanted to focus, like, hey guys, these are the topics. Please work on them. And and that's how Secret Ingredients came into life. Yeah, and it, again, definitely highly recommend the book. Um, there, I and I did like. I really enjoyed the chapter on defense and it resonated with me, the idea that you presented about it's not talked about very often. And you sort of um, break down uh, defense into three sort of types of defense. Um, or would you be able to elaborate on that a bit? Now, I think a lot of the people listening, because um, I think that's even like, I agree with you that it's that's how you get to, to anywhere near your level, for example, like that really resonated with me as a 2100 player. But I think maybe lower on the scale, you do need to defend well, especially against checkmate. But it maybe becomes increasingly important the better you get. But in yes. any way, in any event, Jan, could you briefly describe the sort of three ways that you that you mentioned of uh, of trying to hold on to a position? Yes, we, we actually mentioned four of them. Uh, one one of them was 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 defense by fortress, like trying to keep the position as it is and just hold your castle. Uh, another one was uh, defense by counter uh, attack. Uh, the third one was defense by uh, simplifications, and the fourth one was uh, such a strange one. I think we. I don't really remember how it was how it was in English, but uh, sabotage, yeah, defense by sabotage. That's a very uh, unique one uh, w- where we just felt that sabotage is not the same thing uh, as counterattack. It's just you know making little annoyances to 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 your right. opponent so that he cannot uh, attack so so freely and easily. And okay, as, when when you say this, it's not rocket science, you know. Like everyone uh, defended something by simplification, everyone um, uh, defended by by keeping uh, the the fortress, uh, holding the fortress. But what we need is clarity. Yeah, we need to the habit to 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 tell to say to yourself, okay, I'm in a worse position. How I'm going to defend? 
uh, there are four ways which one is suitable here. Yeah, and this is what you can find in the book, and and you can uh, reasonably reasonably quickly uh, decide which 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 strategy to to adapt and and when to change it, for example. So so this might help to actually make the decisions uh, quicker and 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 easier, because if you uh, if you uh, just skip this uh, strategical and abstract phase uh, when you are thinking uh, abroad, and you just skip uh, immediately into uh, in, uh, into into lines and moves, you you might miss very interesting possibilities. Yeah, and the the what you wrote about the fortress really resonated with me. I recently played first tournament in a long time, and I had a game where I was worse but should be okay, um, and. That was exactly what the position called for. It's one of these positions where you just kind of have to grovel and not do anything. And uh, eventually, I felt like my opponent shouldn't have enough pressure to win the game. But, you know, I'm an, uh, an advanced enough player where I'm familiar with the concept of sometimes when you have an edge um, in a position, you should do nothing and kind of wait for your opponent to screw up. But in working with my coach and looking at that game, uh, Grandmaster Axel Bachman he pointed out, I basically tried to do too much. Like I had this impression of breaking free in the game. You know, I had this impression of like, finally I had some activity and I just went for it. And the activity is what let him, uh, my opponent go on to win the game. Um, so the idea that I just needed to sort of, and it was a queen and two rooks against a queen and two rooks and a bunch of pawns. Apologies for all the, the, uh, chess details without a diagram <laughs> to the listeners. But anyway, it was a position where it's not intuitive that you just don't do anything and just like let them, you know, try to make progress, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but I was nodding my head a lot when you wrote that because it was like the exact description of like why I lost the game. Well, actually, at at uh, in some positions, you just need uh, consciously to allow yourself to do nothing. Yeah, because exactly. we just because we just feel that okay, I should do something. I should do something extraordinary to 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 keep the game, uh, to 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 keep the game alive, to get half a point or or, or more. But actually, in many positions, you just don't need to do that. It's it's a it's a different way of of looking at at activity and 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 what you actually need to do to achieve success. Yeah, and as you say, the very fact of like having this framework that you lay out in mind can be very helpful because then you you kind of know your objective. You're not just like taking it move to move. You know, like okay, I'm doing nothing. You know, <laughs> like that that's my goal, and I think it, it can be helpful to um to to know to know what you're trying to achieve, even if that thing that you're trying to achieve is actually nothing. Um, actually, sorry, so yeah, just, I'll just uh, add to that. When you are looking on at computer games, for example, or at uh, games of top players, there is a lot of waiting. Surprisingly, yeah. uh, so, surpri surprisingly, a lot of waiting, especially in the computer games. They just find some kind of equilibrium and they're doing nothing around that mm -hmm. for maybe 20, 30, 30 moves. Yeah, and it's amazing how that can shift. Yeah, and that's really notable. And as you mentioned, uh, Matthew Sadler and Natasha Regan's Game Changer, they just, yeah, they'll just sit there and torture, I would say torture you, but they're playing another computer, so they can't really be tortured. Um, but um, I wanted to read you a, a, another quote. This one is actually from uh, Grandmaster David Navarra, but I think you can still uh, expound on it, um, which is you asked David, uh, what is the biggest misconception club players believe about Grandmaster Chess? And David said, I think the importance of the openings is overestimated. Club players often say, first, I need to build a decent repertoire of openings. Then I'll focus on the middle game and end game. To tell you the truth, you'll never have a repertoire that you'll be completely satisfied with. It's a Sisyphean, Sisyphean sorry if I said that wrong, effort. There's simply too much theory out there and it's evolving all the time. So another one that really, uh, I felt seen. <laughs> it resonated. <laughs> yes, it's, it's really a Sisyphean work. I mean, yeah. and it's it's a dull work, uh, or as well. I mean, it turns on us into some monkeys who just, you know, are going uh, along these trees of openings and and uh, watching what the computer says and 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 so on. It's somehow, uh, well, it's, it's it doesn't dignify us too much. So I really hate working on openings, honestly. And in, even in my games, I'm not ver I'm playing too much. I'm trying to divert as, as quickly as possible to just get the game. But yes, I mean, uh, what, what is it good for when you get, I don't, I don't know, plus 0.4 as white 
when you just don't understand the position and you just you know uh, uh, ruin it in in two or three moves. So, and I know how da- da- David is playing. For example, he is um, uh, voluntarily taking risks uh, just to take the the opponent, especially the the uh, nominally weaker ones, into some in- interesting area. He's he's ring- risking a lot in in openings and playing rather superficially in openings just to get the game. So this is his approach, fighting one. Yeah, it's um, and it's somehow it's it's again it's another sort of psychological phenomenon where you can be aware of the sort of tendency to um, overemphasize openings or feel like you have to work on them, but still the awareness and the uh, actual behavioral change. There's a gap between them, um, that and which calls to mind time trouble, which is um, another topic that you write. Uh, quite um, poetically in some cases and uh, helpfully in others. Um, so for listeners who play mostly online, time trouble, of course, is when, I mean, you probably know even from playing online, but I, I think it comes across more in tournament chess where you're given a lot of time, but it has a way of just sort of slipping away. And you tell some great stories uh, sort of using, or I, I guess I wouldn't call them stories, but you highlight the clock management of some very strong players um, and and go through a few of positions, critical positions where they use a lot of time. One, of course, being the number one champion of uh, somehow being amazing at chess while still playing in time trouble, uh, Alexander Grushik, but also uh, Grandmaster Dan- Daniel Friedman. You you show a few um, examples of positions where one shouldn't necessarily think. So I don't know if either of those sort of quote unquote stories would fit better with an audio only podcast. But Jan, if you could sort of walk us through that sort of psychological phenomenon, I'm sure um, that that listeners, in addition to myself, um, are, you know, struggle with this. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, we, we need to, uh, we need to keep in mind that we are not only chess players, but also humans that uh, are human emotions and, and the way how we are deciding uh, Somehow we are trying to to make it work together with the game of chess, and sometimes uh, we just decide wrongly because we are transposing the way how we are deciding in the normal world to the chess world, and vice versa. And well, some some things which which are you know um, quite common are, for example, uh, the the huge mistake that we are deciding uh, uh, for a long time because the two alternatives are approximately of the same value. Uh, we, we just think, okay, it's difficult to distinguish between them. They're approximately of the same value, so let's find the best one. But that's, also, uh, but that's uh, very, very impractical, because there is a rule, uh, which, which is also stated in the secret ingredient, that the more important the decision is, the more time you should, uh, of, um, you should work on it, basically. And the importance of the def- decision you you can um, distinguish by comparing the best and the second best uh, option. Yeah. So when the when the options are approximately of the same value, you just pick one and make a move in in in, in, in a minute or two, uh, and not as Daniel Friedman, who was just looking at the position uh, where he could ha- could have gotten to basically. S- identical end games and he was just looking at them for 60 minutes because um, because he couldn't decide which one of them is better uh, even although marginally so you should just make a move and and decide and then uh, in positions where the 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 chance to make a huge mistake is quite great uh, there you should burn all your time or most of your time for example with positions where there's a lot of tactics uh, advanced pass pawn bear kings and so on and so on. So that's a big. Uh, that, that's one of the big mistakes we sometimes do. I also do that. Sorry, Daniel, for mentioning you, but <laughs> yeah, it somehow happened. Uh, another huge mistake which we do is that we somehow use the time not for deciding, but rather for, you know, uh, for example, persuading yourself uh, to, into the yeah. move or um, just uh, I don't know cursing that you have done something uh, wrongly um, beforehand um, or for any other non-chess thoughts 
I have an, an example of Vasily Ivanchuk, who knew that he just messed up in the opening and that he may, needs to make a break, but he saw that, that the resulting position is rather dangerous for him. So he was thinking for maybe, I don't know, 45 minutes, and then he played the move anyway, and he got uh, the same dangerous uh, continuation from Levon Aronian was playing white, but without this 45 minutes. Right. What was the mistake of, 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 of Vasily Ivanchuk? The mistake was that he wasn't deciding. He was just, you know, he was thinking about chess, he was thinking about the position, but he wasn't deciding. And when he wasn't deciding, he shouldn't have burned this time, basically. And there are many, 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 uh, many other stuff. For example, there's a very interesting question uh, to be dealt with, uh, like whether you should think on your opponent's time or not. Uh, and and we are also explaining together with David how to decide rationally whether you just should take a rest or rather work work as hard as 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 on your time yeah so many great great insights there and as you say mentioning a player like uh grandmaster daniel friedman or vasil ivanchuk um obviously we're not trying to like put them on blast and make them look bad if anything it's just like for someone like me it 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 makes them all the more human because um i you know, I and others struggle with with this sort of thing so so much. And echoing what you said, I'll never forget uh, when I interviewed Sam Shanklin many years ago. He one of the bits of advice he gave was those situations where you know what move you're going to play and you're trying to make it work. And he said, just play it because you 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 know you're you know you're going to play it. So like you know, skip the sitting there for 25 minutes because you you might as well just use that time. And that that um. I also had a sort of follow-up question because I've experienced situations, and you uh, show your game with. I believe the the opponent's name was uh, uh, Sek. I'm I wasn't familiar with with uh, the player, um, but where you took him out of book on move three because you identified he's a very strong Grunfeld player, so you're going to play a move that you know isn't supposed to be the best, but you'll get him thinking, and it, it worked very effectively. Um, but what would you recommend in a position where you're unfamiliar with the opening and you feel like you have a, to solve a problem? Like how much is enough in terms of like trying to solve the problem in the opening, as opposed to just like at some point realizing, as you say, you're not going to lose on the spot. So just make a move. Um, well, that's a, that's a question which cannot be answered generally, perhaps. Um, but normally when you are um, confronted by some, some some new concept or some new idea the normal thing to do is not to refute the pro the, the the novelty or the, the the unknown concept but rather to postpone the the important part of the game to the lighter stage so just making some some normal moves maybe a little bit odd move where you might think okay maybe my opponent uh, didn't check this uh, so 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 well for i i might give an example I was playing a guy, uh, a grandmaster in Slovakia, and he played something like d4, knight f6, bishop f4, uh, which was a thing that I wasn't aware of, um, because as I told you before, uh, I, I don't study openings much, and I knew that he, he it wasn't his main weapon. So I just went b6 or some random move, right, yeah. where, I, where, I, where I knew that perhaps his, he, he wasn't checking that. And then we were playing both, and and, and we, we postponed the, the important part of the game for later. Of course, this cannot be done when the um, the challenge you are facing is is of tactical character, for example, or when um, you are in a danger to get into a position where you are strategically worse without any counterplay. Like in in these positions where the the tide is shifting and where you might actually lose a lot. I would recommend to to work a lot, even even when you are facing an opening novelty. Okay, so in rare circumstances, uh, yes, it, yes, it, it's um, good. Yeah. That's that's good to hear. Um, and Jan, uh, if we could tie together your advice, I have a feeling based on on the way you write and your sort of um, you know well read, uh, um, broad broad range of interest background that, that you won't like trying to answer this question, but I feel compelled to answer it anyway, ask it anyway, which is what advice do you give for, for chess improvers about how to allocate their study time? Like if you have say an hour, hour and a half a day, how, how should they spend the time with, with so many uh, potential issues to be addressed? Well, first of all, I would, uh, I would um, uh, maybe 
introspect the motivation of the player. Yeah, what, what why am am I playing chess anyway? Yeah, do I want to <laughs> to enjoy myself? Do I want to achieve successes? Do do I want to be a professional later on, or, or, or what's what's my motivation? Because uh, that that's 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 quite important, I think. Because if I'm a club player who wants just to enjoy myself, I would uh, focus on, on on things that actually bring me this joy. Yeah, I would yeah. just uh, uh, push myself into uh, into some drill or torture for a long time. Because I, if it doesn't fit with my motivation, I will I will just um, go away from it very quickly and just stop the drill after a week or two. But if I really want to improve. Uh, there is a there is a very important uh, part of uh, finding some kind of uh, harmony between playing and working on chess, because uh, when you are playing so much that you are you, you don't have time to analyze your own games, something is wrong, and when you are working a lot uh, without actually playing, that's also wrong because then you just feel um, that you are wasting your time working because you cannot show it anywhere. So so finding some kind of work play balance is important. I would say that for a, a player who really uh, wants to improve, like uh, 40, 50 games uh, a year is a minimum. Uh, for a club player who just wants to enjoy himself, but uh, just wants to keep in some kind of uh, working shape, uh, 25 games should be should be fine. Um, also, I think it's it's very important to analyze your own games, and also what I really think is a very nice tool to work on uh, or to work with is to find a friend and play uh, sparring games. Yeah, and just try to to work on that as well. So there should be a huge portion of analysis of your own games. There should be some some portion of 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 just reading the literature to getting the knowledge uh, with in, in in words, and and there should be a, the drill. The calculation, as well, I would um, I would uh, avoid uh, learning opening theory by heart. Uh, rather than ra- rather, I would uh, suggest, uh, f- for example, picking a, up a player which was style I like and just copying his or her repertoire, studying the games and also the ideas. So, so well, that there's a lot uh, what can be said about this. Uh, maybe I'd, I, I said. Uh, my answer was too complex, um, but it's an interesting question, of course, how to how to build up some training plan which actually works for the person. But I would start yeah. with motivation. Just clarify your motivation. Why are you playing? Because if you answer, I just want to be better because of my ego, um, that's kind of not enough. Yeah, just, just <laughs> let's 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 try. If 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 your answer is just like this, like I want to feel better and 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 have a, a higher rating. Maybe just think about uh, what inspired you in chess 10, 20 years ago. And let's just try to lighten up the spark again. And that w- will paradoxically uh, get you better results in, in, in the future. When you are a little bit unpractical, a little bit emotional about chess, a little bit you know in love with chess, you will get better. Great advice and echoes of what our Grandmaster Vladimir Kramnik said in uh my recent interview, I mean, he was really sort of all about the sort of um, the the growth mindset, the sort of uh, just playing for its own sake. It was sort of a theme that resonated throughout the interview. And when, when we did ask him about chess improvement, that was basically what he said. Just just do what you like. Now, we won't all end up being world champions, of course, but um, I, I do think it's a it's a healthy outlook. Now, Jan, of course, you came up in the sort of year 36. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So you came up... Um, you know, at sort of at the dawn of the digital age, I guess you could say. Um, so a lot of listeners now play primarily online. And I know that when you give advice, like play ideally 50 games a year, uh, if not 25, we're talking about tournaments. Now we have a lot of people listening who maybe have played a few tournaments, or maybe they played when they're kids, but now they are parents and they play more online. So if there's people who are more online focused, but but do have some interest in improving their games, how would you adapt that advice? I mean, obviously, what you said about sparring partners is helpful, but what else can they do? Do they need to go to tournaments in order to improve? Well, could I return for a second to, to Vladimir Kramnik? Uh, because that was very interesting what you said. Uh, I uh, have a big admiration to him when it comes to his uh, love uh, 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 and to, to how passionate he is about chess. 
because he completely changed his style after he was the world champion and 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 afterwards he, he was draw, drawing so many games and so on and then he started to play ultra sharp and various openings and this and that and sacrificing pieces and risking a lot and so on and i i i was just so happy seeing that yeah that that, that even such a major major player can just try to you know get some new experience about chess from chess and and uh, get and find a new approach. So I think that his advice was from heart because he was actually doing it himself. But sorry, let's get back to online chess and to us parents who don't have time to play through <laughs> yeah. the and, and 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 so. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, online world is addictive. So it's a it's and and that's. Uh, that that is uh, the case also with, for example, blitz games. So playing mindlessly uh, blitz games for three hours wouldn't make you happier and wouldn't make you, you know, uh, more relaxed and and wouldn't, you know, uh, le- teach you much. I, I I'm afraid. So I would I would think about first of all. Uh, uh, playing longer formats, if if possible, so longer time controls, maybe fifteen minutes, maybe twenty minutes, if possible. Uh, also, maybe uh, playing with people you know or, or the person knows. Uh, um, maybe having a little bit chat uh, after the game, analyzing together. Or uh, surely uh, it's a good idea to analyze every game I play, or even online. Um, and also maybe just uh, setting some limits to, to to oneself. Like, okay, I'm going to play Blitz games because I don't have time for more, but I will play five games and I want to play them as well as possible. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm not going to play 25 games and, and in the end ending to play H4, A4, the first two moves because I'm so <laughs> right. much, you know, uh, enraged that, that I just want to do anything. So So that's what I would recommend. I myself, I'm, I'm, I'm almost not playing online because I just feel it's, 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 in, it's an addictive thing. But, but I understand that for many people, it's, it's, it's the only um, possibility to, to get, uh, get a game. Okay. Yeah. Ex- excellent advice. And Jan, we're going to take one more break, and then I'd like to hear a little bit more about your, your own climb through the, the ranks and, and your life today. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is known for its proprietary move trainer technology, which utilizes space repetition to quiz you and make sure that you remember whatever tactical patterns or opening sequences that you're working on. They have a huge catalog of great books from top flight authors, both for purchase. And if you check for their short and sweet courses, you can find tons of free content. Speaking of free content, Chessable, of course, has also recently launched an adult improvement focused chess podcast called How to Chess with yours truly hosting it. Check for it on Chessable's YouTube channel, and you can also subscribe on the podcast platforms. And we are back. So Jan, we've been talking a lot about sort of dispensing advice for others, um, but I'd like to hear a bit about uh, your own climb in the chess world. I'm, I'm guessing, based on our conversation, that you read your fair share of chess books. But like, what combination for you of chess improvement came from competing uh, as compared to lessons, as compared to solving tactics, uh, as compared to reading books? Well, I was I was always a reader, so I have read a lot. Um, I never had a structured training. That's maybe surprising, but I never had a schedule uh, saying that okay, Monday you do three three hours of work, uh, Tuesday you do four, and so on and so on. So I just worked when I felt like it, and I didn't work when I just didn't feel like it. Uh, um, I also was helped uh, by a huge amount by Lubomir Vtachnik, which is the chess legend from Slovakia, yeah, person, legend. grandmaster who, who, who played maybe 20 Olympiads or so. So he helped me a lot uh, about understanding chess. Uh, one of the first things he told me actually was like, forget about openings. And <laughs> let's, let's, let's come and analyze. So that was Amazing. nice. Um, yeah, and I was always quite lazy so i didn't do the drills the drill part <laughs> so much 
But maybe it's a mistake. Maybe I could have played better. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I really like uh, always when it started to be a little bit mindless, you know, uh, you know, uh, just re- remembering theory or learning theory and and calculating. I just lost my interest and tried to do something else. So for for that reason, I'm playing, for example, the Sicilian Sveshnikov for 25 years because I never found the motivation to to learn another opening on Grandmaster le- level. Sometimes I hate the Sveshnikov already, but <laughs> you know, being lazy. Yeah, a lot of theory these days. I mean, um, yeah. there's always theory, but yeah, I feel like it's exploded with uh, Magnus playing it in uh, the World Championship, especially. Yeah, but okay, with with you know. Uh, 25 years of experience, you can start step somewhere and just play the position. That's that's fine with me. Yeah, that that makes sense. And and at what age did you start chess, Jan? Well, I, I I've learned the rules maybe uh, around age of seven, but and then I started to play some tournaments at when I was ten, maybe. Oh, okay, late start. <laughs> yeah, rather late start. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and what were your favorite books? You mentioned obviously you've always been a reader, chess books that is. Well, there there are surprisingly uh, good books in in the Czechoslovak region. Uh, for example, Mr. Bachman. I don't know whether mm-hmm. you are familiar of 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 his books. He 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 wrote several very good books, but I'm I'm not sure how much they were translated into English somewhere. Definitely. Um, well, lately I I really admire the, the the free books of Boris Gelfand, for example, which are really good, uh, being written by a very 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 strong player. And again, the language is important for me that that they were written in such a style that you can actually understand the ideas, not just the moves. And of course, we have all the stars as Jacob Agard and Boretsky and and so on. So and Jonathan Rosen. And uh, you name it on them all. It's just they're yeah. All. There's there's so many great ones today. It's amazing. And then of course there's all the video content on top of that. Um, and hearing you mention Gelfand's books, I was lucky enough to interview him. Uh, your another of your fellow quality chess writers, and he did uh, cop to the fact. And uh, Jakob Agard mentions in the intro to one of his books that you know it's sort of the, their books are very much collaborative. Um, even though their Gelfand is listed as the author, I think a lot of it is sort of them talking, uh, Boris talking through his thought process and Jakob helping it put into words. But what does a, a more traditional uh, quality chess writer like yourself, um, how, how do you approach your books? You'd mentioned earlier, um, I wasn't sure from what you said earlier, if you were writing the books in English or writing the books um, in your native language. And, and what's your general approach to getting down your thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm I'm writing them in Slovak and and then okay. get them translated because they are published in Slovak as well. Okay. Uh, so in 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 Czech Republic and Slovakia, and actually, like maybe half of the books is is sold in in this region. So they're amazing, popular in, in in these two countries. So so um, this is how how we do that. Maybe I could I could speak about how we how we wrote the book uh, with David. Uh, sure. Maybe also quite interesting, uh, because David is not the. It's it's not like you know uh, I'm being the ghostwriter and he's being the the big name there. We are friends for 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 a long long time. He's three months older than myself, so we played all these championships together and so on. So we know each other uh, very very well, and um, we, we were writing uh, it mostly uh, through the pandemic or. Uh, uh, and he's in Prague, so we we, we just uh, were speaking via Skype mostly, but we were discussing a lot before I started the, the first the first sentence basically. Yeah. So we even what is like um, what is uh, written by by myself was just you know approved and discussed with David. So that's very interesting. I think that I have the ability to to to. Um, uh, to explain uh, in, in a clear language, and he's got, of course, the experience which I don't have, uh, the experience of the twenty-seven player, which is which is very unique even for me. So that's also that was also in, in, important for me that I was actually interested what he's going to say, and and uh, I I hope that it, 
shows up in the book as well that actually I was interested and 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 that it was interesting uh, yeah basically yeah it it definitely comes across and that's interesting to hear that that your books are so popular in Slovakia I mean again as this one of the strongest or one of the strongest players in your your country uh it does make sense some um, but how is I mean the, the Czech Republic, I feel like I have a, a bit of a better feel for than Slovakia. Um, how uh, how is the chess culture there? Is chess pretty popular there? And are you ever being like recognized on the street? And uh, I'm just curious about stuff like that. Well, w- when I'm being recognized, I'm being recognized because of my non-chess books. And non-chess Amazing. Books, uh, m- mostly, um, but um, well, Czech Republic is 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 perhaps. Uh, has a significantly higher chess culture. There are more tournaments, more great players, uh, more sponsors, let's say. But in Slovakia, uh, chess is pretty popular as well. It's being like maybe sixth or seventh most popular sport in Slovakia. We have like five or six leagues and plenty, plenty club players playing each other. And so we don't have the top players uh, for some reason. Maybe there's not enough funding or we don't have such a shining star as, as David Navarre is, so there is no one to drag drag the players up. I don't know. But okay, what? usually we 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 think about the 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 Czech region and the Slovak region as being like one one chess family because the the languages are very similar and and people are traveling from Czech Republic to Slovakia to play and 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 the other way around. So 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 yeah. Czechoslovakia in the chess world, Czechoslovakia still exists. That's good to hear. And it's it's great that you're still finding so much time for chess, despite all of your success outside of chess. Do you, do you find it hard to, to balance them? Well, um, um, when I'm uh, trying to balance something, it's it's more family and, and work. Yeah. Because family needs a lot of time, obviously. So... So this is the most important stuff. But okay, I, I turned uh, down, for example, the invitation to play uh, the European Championship in uh, Iceland in September, just because I have other things to do, uh, non just things. So sometimes it's it's like that, that I just don't play tournaments because I, I need to do something else. But okay, that's life. And was there a moment where that changed for you? I mean, obviously, you've you've accomplished a lot in the chess world. You've had a lot of opportunity. So was it when the kids came or was it before or after that? Well, I always just felt that it's maybe not enough to play just only chess. So uh, usually when, when, uh, when a young chess player decides to go for the university and just, you know, um, devotes the time to study and just fake it, but really like study... <laughs> Uh, then the decision is already made. I would say it's very difficult to improve when you want to to to, to do the, the the studies and the job well. Yeah, but, makes but, sense. Uh, but honestly, I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm, it's just okay for me. It's it's. Uh, I feel very satisfied that I'm writing books that are being read, and that I'm coaching people which are satisfied with that. And I don't really need to you know, be a strong, very strong player or, or whatever. It's it's uh, it's a kind of lonely occupation, I would say, you know, just trying to beat everyone. And, <laughs> <laughs> like, why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the travel, uh, again, echoing Jonathan Rouse, and that's something that he, I think, he sort of st- struggled with, the sort of existential question of, like, what am I even doing? And obviously he's moved on primarily to, to other pursuits as well. Um so, but when you do think about your chess career, obviously, as we mentioned earlier, you've played some um, some truly elite players and accomplished a lot in in your own right. What what are your fondest memories, Jan? Well, I, I was the European champion under sixteen. Uh, that's uh, quite long time ago, but that's something I'm I'm, I'm returning uh, back with uh, two with fond memories, basically. Where where was that tournament? Uh, it was in in Greece, two thousand one, I think, maybe two thousand. I'm I'm not sure. And I won the the Riga University Open tournament once. Um, that was also nice. And I've beaten uh, Jan Krzysztof Duda, who was wow. beating Carlsons. And th- that wasn't so so uh, long ago, actually, maybe three or four years. So 
but okay, he he he, he had a bad game. He was better than me uh, even then. But it's nice to nice to see how the guy you have beaten is beating Carlson. That's, yeah, that's... going to the candidates and yeah, as we record this, so this will be out in a couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, Jan Christoph Duda is in the final against Karyak, and of course, and by uh, in of the Chess World Cup, the FIDE Chess World Cup, and of course, uh, by reaching the finals, he and Karyak and both have secured coveted spots in the uh, candidates tournament to determine who challenges the who challenges in the 2022 cycle the winner of the upcoming uh, Carlson and Napomneci World Championship match. Um, so are you still finding time with all of your work responsibilities and your family and your writing? Are you still able to sort of like when the World Cup's going on, how much attention are you paying to it, Jan? Well, I'm replying the games once they have ended, but I'm not watching the broadcasts. That's just too much time to, to devote to that. Of course, the the the, um, the people who are doing the bro- broadcast are often like very funny and and it's it's very enjoyable. But I just can't find so much time. But yeah, I'm trying to to have a look at the at the at the games because I'm just interested in what's going on in the chess world. Yeah, I hope I'm not telling tales out of school. But when I interviewed Kramnik, it was also during the World Cup, and I I said thanks for doing this during the game because it was about an hour into the World Cup, and he said, "Oh, are they playing today?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. There, there, there are actually quite a quite a few these these uh, top events. So if you want to follow them all, that might be quite um, time consuming. Yeah, I feel that way, uh, especially now with the online events. But the World Cup, I, I try to carve out time for as best I can. Um, mm-hmm. um, so, Jana, I think we've covered most of the topics I wanted to cover. I am curious. I mean, I feel like we've gotten a good sense, in addition to some great chess advice, we've gotten a good sense of your personality. But are there any sort of uh, outside interests that you haven't mentioned? I mean, you're pretty busy with uh, reading work and family. But do you have any other uh, hobbies outside of uh, those in chess? Well, yeah, I, I I like poetry, for example. Uh, I like Japan, uh, Japanese tea, uh, Japanese arts, and and all of this stuff. We do a lot of hiking with with the family, uh, and and so on. Yeah, and have you been to Japan? No, no, not yet. But but maybe one day. They don't then they don't play chess, you know. They have their own yeah. chess, and that's. That's a nuisance, yeah. I would really love to to go there to play a tournament, but they are just not playing our chess. So what can I do? Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. Next time makes it makes it harder to uh, schedule a trip around it. Um, okay, well, uh, Jan, I'm going to give some instructions for your book giveaway. So just uh, bear with me for a minute. But I will um, first of all just want to reiterate, uh, as you, listeners can probably tell, Jan's books are incredible. So. I highly recommend uh, anyone who's found this interview compelling to check out both uh, Under the Surface and The Secret Ingredient. Um, So for the book giveaway, we're going to give away three books this time. And what we're going to do is continue to shamelessly promote our other podcast, How to Chess. So if you want to enter this giveaway, what you need to do is email me a screenshot that you subscribed to How to Chess on any platform. It doesn't matter. It can also be on Chessable's YouTube channel. As long as you just show me a screenshot that you're subscribed in the email, then you are entered in the contest. So email ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, Jan's book is available in physical form as well as on Forward Chess, both of his recent books. Um, so uh, to the extent possible, I will let you all choose. But if it's somewhere that's difficult to ship to you, uh, we may have to get you the Forward Chess book. We'll uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, so uh, just wanted to announce that before we say goodbye, Jan. But 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 now it is that time. Do you have anything to add before uh, before we call it a night in Bratislava and an afternoon here in New Jersey? Well, well, surely, I, surely I do. Thank you for your invitation, Ben. It was a, oh, sure. a nice hour. Uh, which we had together, and uh, yeah, uh, I hope that that everyone who is listening to us will improve a lot in their game, <laughs> and, uh, that they will have a lot of nice chess um, experiences in the future. Thank you so much. And actually, one more, Jan. Are, are there more chess books in your future? I certainly uh, hope so. I'm not sure about that, but 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 maybe maybe we will see. Okay, so nothing in the works, but we'll keep our oh, fingers well. crossed. Um, and Jan, I believe your email address is in the intro to your book. Um, you you seem like a fairly offline person, but is that right? Is your email address public? 
Yes, my email address is public. It's jan.marcos uh, at gmail.com. So if you have any other questions that spring into your mind, please just write me an email and I will I will be happy to answer. Okay, excellent. All right, so listeners, we'll, we'll put the links to the books in the show description as well as Jan's email address. And Jan, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your wisdom with us. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible, most of all to my producer, Matthew Passy. I also would like to thank everyone who helped spread the word about the show. Did you guys know that there's still people who have not heard of the Perpetual Chess podcast? There's even chess players who have not heard of the Perpetual Chess podcast. So we need to fix that. And the ways to do that include writing positive reviews on podcast platforms or YouTube comments telling friends, all that stuff makes a difference in helping spread the word about the show. But of course, I most of all want to thank people who provide financial support to the show. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. So without further ado, I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, Apprentice Twitch Channel, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, the Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Key, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Farhan Thawar, Barasawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, I am Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, James Holyhead, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsythe, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Sell, The King's Crusher YouTube channel, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Officers of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, The Famous Mr. Dodgy, The Nerd Nays Twitch channel, Grandmaster Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodi, Philip Flummins, The Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Ross Crossland, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gerson, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Bean, William Hogarth, and I also would like to thank Ace Baega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue. Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio K. Leonfort, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard, Lynn, Brian, Chase, Brian, Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Chad Hilton, Chess Pats of Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Blaskotschek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Tennis Parrish, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Melo Paria, Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Francis Latart Lavoir, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Gene Stewart, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Bihan, Jacob Kovach, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse Takumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Joe Dasano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tully, Juan Almagar, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kavutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, 
Kyle, McAvoy, Larry, Cook, Larry, Ryforth, Laura, Boyovsky, Macaulay, Peterson, Maria, Amalyanovas, aka Photo Chess, Mark Shaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovich, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobo, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Negma Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Blaine, Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited of Switzerland, Randall Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Titi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, The Say Chess YouTube Channel and Publishing Empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krauss, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Sergey McCagan, Seth Ruzica, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatev Abrahamian, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edsel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Jivko Stoyanov. Thanks to you all for the support, and we will catch you all next week.